can our community thrive? Recruit and retain the 21st century workforce that makes our progress, those on our campus who are part of our community, makes our progress possible. And examine whether the regulatory environment in our state, which is under review, and on our campus, positions us to meet Kentucky's needs and priorities. We formed five work groups around these board priorities and reached out across campus, including to our shared governance leadership for community members who could participate in each initiative. The board asked for regular reports at each meeting and a series of substantive recommendations that they expect in June. Just last month, after hearing reports from each work group, the board directed me and our campus to prioritize the formulation of recommended changes to our governing regulations that will help UK accelerate its efforts in aligning with Kentucky's needs. We are starting with our governing regulations, but we are not ending with them. Our governing regulations are, in effect, our university's constitution. They enumerate the principles of how we are to operate, who has authority and responsibility, and how that ladders up to the board to ensure a collaborative and intellectual environment. Ultimately, the changes that I will recommend to the board are designed to clarify the principles enumerated in our governing regulations and give clear direction for those of us on how we can and should work together to honor our mission. That process will necessitate, as contemplated in our strategic planning by our board, that we then address our administrative regulations and other processes that are there to operationalize our governing regulations and principles. Chair Collette is right when she cites the length of our administrative regulations well into hundreds of pages, as well as other business processes. They need to be scrutinized and refined as well, and to be made more user-friendly. So we will do so. But this is the first step in a multi-step process. There's not a crisis, there's not an emergency. We are strong and we're making tremendous progress thanks to so many in this room and across this campus. Probably cool to hear what people are doing. <laughs> <laughs> but there's also recognition among our board that if we are to remain strong, we are to control our progress and not leave our faith to others. It is important that we work actively to determine our that we must begin now to position our campus to move quickly and intentionally to do more and be more for Kentucky. That's the direction I've been given by our board, and we will honor that direction. To that end, I've been gratified by all of those who have taken time and devoted their energy to engage with me on the central issue of what shared governance means on our campus and how we can strengthen it. Hundreds of community members, faculty, staff, students, and administrators have come together in small settings to engage in discourse. As I wrote to the campus recently, four themes emerged from this dialogue. Number one, we need more understanding there are strong views among many on this campus, and including many among you, that the rules and regulations we have today protect shared governance and in our institution. Some of you are vested 
in the current structure and processes because you have worked so hard to create the rules that you believe protect and promote the university's best interests. Understand. And I do agree that rules exist to guide conduct and action irrespective of whoever the president is or how others in position of responsibility may feel in the moment. Specifically, the governing regulations ensure the primacy of faculty in the development and implementation of the curriculum. And they undergird the idea that the creation of new programs, courses, majors, initiatives, the robust vetting and review before they're given a green light. Moreover, our faculty, through systematic and fully understood and defined peer review processes, hold primary responsibility for performance review. And in rare instances, when we do not live up to our standards, it is first the responsibility of faculty to hold one another accountable. I steadfastly agree with these principles, and I believe our board strongly shares these views. So let me be clear. Any recommended changes to our governing regulations strongly state the primacy of faculty in the curriculum and course content and the strong role and voice you must play in the review and approval of academic programs as well in the processes we have for performance review. And that promise holds for days we all have to work together to avoid a day that we ever have to contemplate closure of the program. Ah, and so does our board, have every faith and confidence in our faculty and their ability to deliver a world-class education to conduct outstanding research and serve in so many ways across Kentucky. I believe in your commitment to holding yourselves and each other accountable for how we do these things. And I will leave no doubt about my intent to honor that and codify it in any other governing regulations, just as I have left no doubt throughout my tenure about my commitment to to academic freedom, and even more so the essential nature of a diverse and inclusive community at the University of Kentucky. With humility, but bolstered by you, and fulfilling the responsibility you entrust me with on this campus. I can say no one has acted spoken more strongly on these seminal issues of inclusion for us than I have. Our board has never questioned me, and they have fully supported me when I spoke out on these matters. That said, I've heard from many, and I believe it is true, that our system needs refinement and what I'm calling more clarity. Many find the rules too numerous, <coughs> too confusing, and too constrained. We need fewer roadblocks in red lights and more empowering guidelines and clear directions. We need improvements in our administration, our administration's effectiveness and efficiencies in interacting with our shared governance bodies. So can we find better ways? listening to one another in forums such as this to make improvements that will better serve our faculty, staff, and students. I believe we can. Indeed, here again, I've been heartened by the feedback I've received in sessions with members of our community as well as the outreach by email and other platforms from others including university senators. One such email 
from one of your colleagues of the Senate made a critically important point about the need to provide definitions for and parameters around vital terms such as educational policy and educational practice. We know that institutions of higher education share many common characteristics and think about these things in similar ways. We also recognize that we have different cultures and we've evolved in different ways. But the point about providing better definitions for review by all of us around these foundational terms I think it's important. It's exactly what we need in the big picture and missing driven emphasis. And I believe our governing regulations need, and what our gover governing regulations need right now, but that important ways they may be lacking. So I appreciate the kind of feedback I've received from you on this. Next, more local control. Faculty and administrators at the college and unit level should have a stronger, though not the only, voice in more academic and administrative decisions that are largely confined to their units. So can we find ways to entrust our colleagues across the colleges to make such decisions? Can we work together to refine our rules, guided by clear principles about promising, and if so, better serve our students and our campus. I believe we can. Finally, more voices. Respectfully, we have a university <coughs> senate in name, but not in practice. No vote. Simply put, means no voice. And on the University Senate today, the faculty virtually have all the voice. As Chair Collette recently communicated, shared governance requires involving the faculty governance body, the University Senate. This morning's communication under the University Senate letterhead was addressed to university faculty members. I respect that. Certainly on most, on many issues, faculty have promised, and we should make that clear and uphold it. But staff have none. This alone tells me it would be a disservice to this campus to shrink from these matters. Students have consistently told me that their voice is dismissed or diminished in the context of the University Senate. And I know no one in this room does this with any intention. But it is their lived experience. Perception is reality. We can refine and improve that in ways that ensure more voices are heard more people who bring so much to our community are at the table. And creating a bigger table doesn't mean a weaker table. It can strengthen us. Spreading out lines of authority or areas of promise may make some of us, including me, uncomfortable or uneasy. All of us like what we know and find comfort with what we're used to. But can we listen to voices of those who don't feel as though they have a voice and modify our structure in ways that ensure that more of us can play a role, determined not by class, but by expertise? I think you can. I'm still gathering feedback, I'm still listening, including today. And I want to take your questions and hear your thoughts. That stage of this process will continue for the next several days. By the end of the month, I intend to provide in advance to the Senate Council 
and the executive bodies of the staff and student leadership, and then to our campus, more details about the principles and ideas for possible revisions to the governing regulations. I will meet directly with the Senate Council and executive leadership of the other shared governance bodies to seek more feedback. We will repeat this exercise each week as we seek continued refinements to any proposed changes in the governing regulations. These refinements will build upon, will build out the clear language that will form the basis of any recommended governing regulation changes I will make to the Board of Trustees for their consideration at the April meeting. This is an iterative process. I will be listening, I will make changes, going directly by the feedback of you and others. I hope you know that we, our board, myself and many more who believe there is an imperative to accelerate our progress, are doing so for Kentucky. And I want you to know that I heartily believe that your decision and your determinations, you believe, are best for Kentucky as well. We want the same thing, I believe. We may have differences on how we get there. I know, too, that some of you sincerely and honestly disagree with the path we're on, and it has given you doubts or a lack of confidence how we're leading. I want you to be sure, to be sure that whatever form your expressions take and how your concerns are registered, I respect you. <coughs> that will never, ever change. I respect your responsibility to make your voices heard. Nothing, nothing will change that. This is how I, this is how I, this is how deeply I believe in our calling as educators, a calling for which I've dedicated my adult life, and I know many across this room have accepted that same call. There is an inextricable link between academic freedom and unfettered debate and the vibrancy and strength of our community. In fact, all of this to me is an indicator of how much we care. Please know that I recognize we are all acting out in a sincere and acting out of a sincere and deep reservoir of belief and commitment as well. The idea that what we are doing is for our people, our students, staff, and faculty who comprise a special community. We're doing it for Kentucky, whose name we bear and whose advance is a sacred promise. Our board believes strong, and I, and I and more people, and I think you realize, agree that refinements to our rules do not diminish our mission. They can make it strong. That mission, my heart, will always be about this state. And I know you hold this state in your hearts as well. So in that spirit, I want to turn back to the questions I posed to the campus. What is your definition of shared governance? How is it important to you? What have you seen or experienced that reveals it to you, both in positive and negative ways? You believe that all areas of shared governance should have equal weight and any other feedback that you would like to provide. So Chair Flood, thank you for your time. Thank all of you. Thank you for giving me the honor of leading Kentucky University and the ability day in and day out to tell what I think are the most powerful stories in this common world. Thank you very much. Now, take any questions? 
Hi, Bob Grossman, Parks and Sciences. Uh, President Capilouto, thank you uh, for coming here to talk to us today. And uh, I will say that your, your uh, talk today it did provide some reassuring uh, things in it. Uh, I think one of the reasons why this uh, process has become so controversial is the nature of the evidence that the Deloitte consultants produced and was used as a, cited as a reason for going forward with these reviews. Um, it was basically a hit job on the Senate. It was unprofessional and uh, not, it was not um, correct in many of the things it stated. Uh, citing the length of a document as evidence of inefficiency is just you know, ludicrous. Um, so uh, I guess what I would like to hear from you is a statement that, that you will not use that report as a starting point or as a guide to the um, reforms that you hope to uh, present to us later. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. Let, let me say that there's something quite clear in all of this. I think we'd all recognize that the Senate rules don't make clear that the board has final authority for everything. Now what happens in that context is what we're talking about. How do we share these responsibilities? What are those and in what situation, how we exercise that? And that's what we're trying to refine. And I would have to say, more voices at the table when we do so. So I, I think that remains the case that they've asked us to look at. Lauren Cable, College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, I'm going to repeat Bob's question, which is why did Deloitte focus exclusively on the University Senate, and how can you justify their call for restructuring given that they admitted it wasn't scientific and it was, as Bob said, a good job? So I certainly think if one wants to look at the rules and regulations of the groups in which they compared, and you find differences, please let me know. I think there is validity in the recognition of the lack of clarity in our governing regulations in terms of decisions and responsibilities when it comes to educational policy. I would think too, through the numerous conversations I have, that there is still cause to engage in feedback and consider our ways that we govern ourselves. So that's what I want to hear from you. President Capuluto, I love your story. I love your tone. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, every year you would come to our Senate and praise the university and give a lot of credit, very, in a very humble fashion, to credit to the faculty. I believe you. I wanted to believe you. I believe that you believed what you were saying. And now all of a sudden, the faculty is the problem. The taste of this change was quick. The study was unscientific. Data and details were scarce and secret. Faculty members were still in secrecy. I just hope my doctors at UK Health Chair do not conduct hasty, unscientific, and secret studies to decide on my care. There are past presidents with legacies. Uh, two that remind me, I am reminded of these, top 20 in 2020 and the next great university. I just hope your legacy would not be the presidents who weaken faculty governance and the university senate. 
if you give me one wish, I heard you, I heard you said constitution, I heard you said college level. If you give, grant us or me a wish would be that you, we agree at the university, consultation with a subset of faculty, select few faculty members is not the same as consulting consultation with a faculty at large. Right. That's my only wish to ask you. And we should be able to choose our own representative. If those two <coughs> kind of go together, I would like to ask you to grant that wish to us. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, Seth Berg Pullen, um, Arts and Sciences. President Kapalula, you spoke a lot about uh, respect, and I appreciate, I appreciate uh, your, your respect for us. But there are different kinds of respect. One kind of respect is between equals, and the other kind of respect is between those who have much more power and who have much little less power. And I worry that you are afraid of the respect between equals, between the university senate and the administration, and perhaps other, 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 uh, other stakeholders. But respect has to be between people who can, die, who can, who can continue to speak to each other freely and without worry about their programs being shut down, without worries about Frankfurt intervening, and the University Senate, such with the rules that it has now, is our best bet to keep that kind of respectful dialogue going. Thank you. Thank you very much. I couldn't agree with you more. I tell your story every day, and I want to tell you it's a damn hard story to tell now, Frankfurt, but I tell it with pride. And I've told you, and I'll tell you again, I'm going to reserve, I'm going to work to protect what I, I see as your primacy when it comes to program development, curriculum, course content. That will be strongly codified in whatever we do. Now, I cannot promise you what Frankfurt may do. You know, a week or so ago, a week or so ago they introduced legislation that was going to require a civics course in our uh, core curriculum. What did I tell people? We care about our core curriculum. Our board charged the group on our campus. Ultimately, our university senate, our faculty are going to determine what's best for the 21st century. Leave us alone. I don't say it exactly that way. But we accept that responsibility, and, and, and I cherish it as much as you do, sir. Excuse me. Scott Hills, uh, engineering, and uh, since you, you found me as a First Amendment person, I think I need to live up to that. You see, Scott. <laughs> When you have a group discussion, don't invite a lot of people. <laughs> he has a lot of things to say. No, no, so I gave him the First Amendment uh, reward. And, uh, yes, now, sir. Now I have to live up to it. Yeah, so, you will. Uh, no. I, I looked at a couple of comments, but I did something you said. I just want to, I guess, make a comment about something that said. And you talked about Kentucky first. And I'm curious because a number of years ago you put together the infrastructure, you know, which you had that pilot study about coming up with these agreements to make new dorms or we, you know, got the lease and you had other people build it, they're kind of controlling it. And then after the first year pilot study, the next thing you know is that the whole campus is now under, you know, and, and you've done a great job. I mean, it looks great. But when you say Kentucky first, you know. I think the dorms and the prices that went along with that, the cost of education, you know, how do you sell that to an Eastern Kentucky family, first generation family, trying to afford sending their kids to college, or the inner city mom, dad, who are trying to look at the cost of college? They don't care about temperature mattresses. They don't care about granite countertops, okay? That sells to the New England middle class families where we tend to get a lot of our students. But that doesn't seem Kentucky first. Now, that's just a little note on the side. Well, um, may I comment on that? Before please go now ask the question. Okay. All right, so first of all, we have rebuilt this campus 
All of you want to know, it's $5 billion, several million square feet. We spend less of our revenue, the percentage of our revenue spent on debt today is less than it was when I got here, okay? We didn't spend foolishly. We have not put our university under duress. Our average tuition increase over the last several years has averaged less than 2%. We have grown our enrollment. We admitted 6,500 students last year. That's 3,000 more than 10 years ago. The percentage of our students, it's a bigger number, that come from families whose average income is less than $25,000 has been steady. We got 25% of 6,500 students who have an average income family of $25,000. So I'd ask you to look at the evidence. We have not closed the door to Kentuckians. Through our innovative leads program, that everybody around the country comes and copies now. But $150 million. We have donors who see that this program works. They invest money. $5 million a month up the month we get for this. Why? Because it works for those Kentuckians. So please know. When I say Kentucky first, when I go in to see a legislator, when I go in to see somebody from Eastern Kentucky, I tell them that story, and they usually have somebody from their community. When I travel with the pigments all through Eastern Kentucky and go through those high schools, where 50% of some of those kids don't have a parent in the home, do you think I'm deaf to that? It would be a disservice to you, and I will never do it. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I appreciate your comments, and I, and I agree with you. Well, one thing I'll say, though, is when I go there and recruit, the number one concern is the cost. And just saying, that's just the number one concern. Of that's that's for everybody, policy. and that's why it is a number one priority for us. And I ask you to acknowledge it. Thank you. So my, my question, now, and that was the second one you said you talked about. So my question is, you asked about shared governance. And I look at my limited experience here, and I don't have the wisdom and knowledge of a lot of people in the room. But when I observe how the university has been operating for the last, even before U.S. president, you know, it's like you have, you know, the administration side and you have the faculty or the academic side. And when I look at the administration side, I don't see a lot of shared governance there. I don't see, we may be on a search committee for a position or we may something like this, but I don't see a lot of shared governance. I don't see a lot of faculty, staff, student with what I would, I would use the word about, you know, you know significant input or, or a voting voice on that side of things. And so, and I'm not criticizing because I also look at the administration as helping support the faculty to do what we do best, okay? I also know that students don't come to University of Kentucky because we have a great administration. That's not their consideration for coming to University of Kentucky. They come here for other reasons. Usually faculty, it could be parents come here, it could be just UK ID, it could be sports, whatever. Okay, I, I have yet to see a student that comes here because of an outstanding administration. And that's not a criticism, it's just, recognizing where we fit together. The fact that we are on the front lines, we have the, the privilege, I'll call it the privilege, we have the privilege of being on the front lines, and we have the privilege and responsibility of a long-term perspective, where we are looking at students as they come in, as they go through, as they go to graduate, and after graduation, getting jobs and things like this and working with industry. I put all that because when the administration, you know, on, on, the, on the academic side, the one thing that you have been very clear on, which again, you made it confirmed today, is we know the governing regulations explicitly state you have no control over admissions policy standards and you have no control over degree, the number of credit hours of graduation. And of course, when you talk about shared governance, you always talk about curriculum and programs and things like this, but you, have, you certainly leave out the admissions and that kind of stuff. We talked about this in our meeting a little bit. And so I, I know the government regulations you want to change so you have more control over admissions. The truth 
Well, I haven't said that. Um, no, no, no. Okay, you, you tell me how you feel about it. I haven't okay. said that. Yeah, but, I, I, but there's a quote on right after the board of directors meeting, or board of uh, trustees meeting, where on that quote that was on the web page that's a tribute to you, you talked about admissions and about enrollment management that you, that's what you were focused on. Okay, you, you leave it out today because I know what you're focused on. And I understand that, but the, the issue is, is that the admissions people, the enrollment management people, they have their responsibilities and their charge. We have a much broader perspective, and we will always have a broader perspective. And so I am certainly concerned under shared government <coughs> that our broader perspective of concern to the students as we take them from <coughs> before they get here to when they get here until after graduation, we're on the front lines. And for the administration to kind of come in and try to take over that aspect, it, it, it does concern me because that doesn't seem, you want us to be advisor role, and I'm wondering, you want us to be the same advisor role that we are to the administration now? Because faculty don't seem to have any advisor role in administration. The second point is, we talk about local, bring it down to the local level, okay? Um, you know, if we had, if, if the faculty had a voice, and if we said, you know what, let's say we had a vote of no confidence for a particular dean, okay? Would that allow the administration to come in and say, you know, faculty don't support this dean more, so we're going to have a different dean? You know, I would like to say that if we had shared governance and we had equal respect, that if someone lost their confidence, the leader lost their confidence at a local level, that the, they would have some say in what happens at that local level. I don't see that happening in the administration, but yet when it comes to the faculty governance, if the deans are kind of the quote unquote local decision makers of the faculty they're feeding into, I do know there's programs that would not get approved if the faculty had more control at the local level because the deans would just roll over the faculty and move on and not have a, a, a broader perspective. And so there's some there's, there's just concern that I have. It's like if I use this analogy and I don't don't know disrespect. But it's like I think we know each other. That's yeah. <laughs> It's like it's like Mr. Mr. Potter and the you know it's a wonderful life movie. You got the administration that controls almost everything, and now they're going after the one thing that they don't control. Like Mr. Potter went after the one thing that he didn't control. That's what it just that's what it seems like in this discussion, and that's what concerns me because I think we have good examples of what shared governance is not. That's what administration <coughs> works right now, in my perception, and I think we have a very good understand how shared governance works when it comes to the university center and the support that the administration gives us to help make decisions. And that's, to me, the way shared governance is meant to be, at least on the back of the side. Okay. Sure, uh, I'll, I'll take seriously everything you've said. I'm here to listen, especially your comments about admissions and so forth. But there's one thing I'm going to have to take issue with. Yes. Because like in the middle of the night last night, or the night before, I watched a dedicated, you can call it administration, I call it your partner, who doesn't disrespect you in any way, who is there to be your partner, you know, to get those students across the line at Rubber Ring. And I just have to take issue with you, sir. I think the way you just described our administration, especially in the way we deal with students, um, it hurts. Because I watch heroes in all hours of the night to be your partner to do what we're here to do together. So I hope you'll take that at heart. I deliver it with respect, sir. Hi, you are the College of Fine Arts. Thank you for your speech and thank you for all your comments. My question is, because faculty are concerned, so we would like to have some kind of assurance. If you can share your vision for shared governance, what that structure looks like, not the idea of it, but how are we structurally making it work? What would that look like? We would like to know that. Thank you. So that's what I'm here to hear from you. If you think it should be just like this, fine. But if you have any other ideas, what are your ideas about more voices? 
I personally, this works. Okay, thank you. Richard Charnico, and then Richard? Hi, Richard Charnico, Senate member from College of Public Health. Uh, I've been on the Senate now for five years. I think things largely work well. Um, speaking for myself, though, I, I am amenable to the concept of more voices. I would welcome staff and student participation. Uh, at the same time, I would uh, hope, uh, with, with respect, President Capilouto, that it wouldn't uh, become any kind of zero-sum game. In fact, I would suggest that if the uh, governing regulations were to be modified in such a way that the Senate structure were changed to include more staff and students, I, I would respectfully suggest that uh, more faculty voices be added as well. Uh, there are some uh, colleges uh, with a relatively small number of voices on the Senate. The uh, size of the university is uh, growing over time, and uh, the, there are many committees that uh, have to draw on expertise outside of the Senate, and I think some of that's fine. But I would encourage a look at, uh, along with bringing more staff and student voices, also bringing more faculty voices, uh, allowing more uh, faculty to be on the Senate, if, if, that's, if, if the composition of the Senate is something that is going to be uh, looked at in the uh, future governing regulations. So again, su supportive of more voices, but not wanting to be any kind of zero-sum game. Thank you. Uh, Richard, may I ask a follow-up of you? One of the questions I'll pose to individuals is the weight of different representatives of our, um, our shared governance constituencies. Do you have any thoughts about that? Oh, and, and, and bearing on particular issues? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't have a ready uh, thought on that. Um, maybe Maybe a crude ballpark, and uh, other people may take issue with it, and that's fine. This is just kind of off the cuff. Well, you don't, Maybe you don't have to third. commit now. You can send me an email. But. Well, I'll, think as long as I'm here, as long as I'm here, <laughs> maybe two thirds, one sixth, and one sixth. Uh, that adds up to 100 percent, I think. Um, <laughs> I think that um, the different uh, tasks that uh, require or uh, warrant participation by uh, different constituencies uh, may also call for different uh, breakdowns. So there may be some uh, committees or some responsibilities for which the, the breakdowns are different than the overall composition of the Senate. Actually, that's the case right now, because right now, uh, when it's time for the Senate to look over degree lists, that that's for elected faculty senators uh, only to, uh, to to vote on that. So I think that different committees and uh, and and different responsibilities might call for different balances of involvement. But maybe for the body as a whole, maybe for the body as a whole, roughly two thirds, one sixth, one sixth. Just throwing it out there. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Molly Clayton, College of Arts and Sciences. Um, I want to agree with things that you heard from Richard that the weight should be in some ways proportional to expertise and the types of decisions that stand before us. But what I really want to speak to is, is um, to your point about partnerships and, and models for these reforms and how we, how we can go about doing it uh, together as, as true partners. Uh, you've heard some of the some of the, the, the pain. You've acknowledged the fear, the doubt um, that you're hearing, particularly from faculty around these issues. There was one. And I, 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 I'm feeling doubts and 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 fear and and pain around this. But I've been trying to move beyond that and think about this from different. What is the administration looking for? What does the board need? 
um, and what, what, does, what does the University Senate need? So I've been looking for models, and I, I, I hope that my uh, reputation with you is as someone who gives you things to read. So I'm going to give you something that I, that I hope you'll read. This is, a, this is an article by Steve Balls. He uh, wrote this about a little less than a year, year ago. And it's, um, it's from the Association for Governing Boards. So I'm looking, what, do, what do governing boards see as best practices? Sure. What do trustees see as best practices? So this is an article called Transforming Shared Governance into an Engine for Agility, something we call nimbleness sometimes. So I've been trying to open my mind to what do these different constituencies beyond faculty, beyond the university senate, what does the administration need, what does the board need? And in reading this piece, I see there's so much that we're doing, that you're talking about, and that we're doing that, that is, is good, that is right, that in my ten years here has, has really happened. So, the author talks about moving from constituency-minded thinking to institutional thinking, right? So constituencies, right, what does the faculty want, what does the faculty demand, what does the administration need, right, this sort of siloed thinking. Mm -hmm. Moving beyond that to institutional thinking, mm -hmm. right? And I've seen that happen in my time here. I feel it in myself. I can tell you the five pillars of UK purpose, right? I have changed my research and my teaching to align with the needs of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. I live this every day. I feel that I move, thanks to your leadership, into this, insti this institutional-minded practice. Um, so there's a definition of shared governance here that, that is really about developing a system of shared governance that brings together these three constituencies, right? The board, uh, and develops a system of trust, right? Between the board, the administration, and, and the faculty. It's around a culture of transparency and open communication, which in some ways we're doing well, and in some ways we're, we're I think, uh, not doing as well as we could be. Um, having a shared set of metrics, what does it look like to be successful? Something that we come to together as, as a team, as real partners, informing metrics around success. Um, a set of checks and balances, something we talk about a lot is the strength of the current university senate. Um, and a commitment to jointly considering difficult issues and jointly developing strategic uh, directions together. So my question for you is, are you open to having the University Senate as a true partner in shared government? What would it take for you to engage us as true partners, as collaborators in devising these changes to the governing relation, uh, governing regulations? What, what can we do to make this a, look a little different so that we're true partners so, so um, in the that, efforts? Excuse me. Given that everything you sent me, either I've read or my wife has read, <laughs> and I will read that carefully. So I really think you hit on something that I struggle with. Right? Sometimes I think, with due respect, that the Senate focuses on things like this. But maybe some of those you can trust your fellow faculty in the college to handle some of those, okay? There needs to be a way that we check, I would say rather quickly, I don't know how the idea is about how you necessarily do this, such that we don't duplicate and we encourage collaboration. What you're talking about are the big issues. And I communicated and said, and sometimes I believe we lose sight of the forest for the trees is because we're down here in the trees. And those issues you talked about, that's our future. But for whatever reason, I don't think we spend that much of our time on So, and then the other thing you said, that, that I don't, I don't have a solution for it. You know, I was really struck when a staff member who had more expertise than, you know, it didn't surprise me, but just that reminder about a particular area. And, and that's who I was really quoting here. When, he, when this person said to me, you know, it's, it's not about my class, it's about my expertise and what I can bring. So when you, you know, when you have those just bodies, you know, that maybe you're representing their constituents, that's fine. But, but how do you bring that expertise together to make those decisions 
appropriate that they're lighted up. That's an ideal to me. I, I haven't figured out yet how to do it. If I, if I can respond just briefly, I, I think we're more open to embracing change than you imagine. And that if we are brought in this true partner, we can collaborate together to make changes. We're ready to examine our practices. We're ready to look at the rules. We want to be involved in those conversations. We want, to, we want you to engage the elected faculty representatives, the faculty leadership and Senate Council, right? the, the leaders that you have that are coming right, from faculty elections as, as senators. We, we want to be part of the formulation of these solutions. And I think we can look at some examples of recent successes. We look at the tech, right, the QEP, the tech program. It's something that we did quickly, that we did collaboratively, that we were brought in on early, that we were informed about, we acted, and, and it's, it's launched, and it's, 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 it's transforming. Uh, and, and, and moving us into the future. Okay. It's an example of a awesome. success. So I, I think we have, we have we have things like positive examples we can look at. And I, I think if you can open your mind to the fact that we are more open to, to change and adaptation than you might think, um, I think that's the, the way forward here. Molly, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, last thing is a chat. So this is from the chat. Um, the president has said he wants the Senate to be more efficient and respond more quickly, but that can seem at odds with the desire to expand the number of voices that are represented in the Senate. Can you explain how more voices will result in more efficiency? I'll repeat the first part of that. Excuse me. Uh, the president has said he wants the Senate to be more efficient and respond more quickly. But that can be at odds with the desire to expand the number of voices represented in the Senate. Well, I could go through a lot of examples, but I'm not. But I would say this. The possibility that I'd ask you to entertain that more voices at the college level that you trust to make decisions. You could have more voices there on matters that are, you know, largely involving that college to make those decisions. One way I'll look at it. Daniel. Daniel. Fresher. He's on the box. Oh, excuse me. Yes, hi, thank you. I appreciate your comments and thank you for joining us today. I apologize for uh, asking my question from the pickup line. Um, <laughs> you made an analogy to the Constitution, which I think is an interesting one, and a change to the GRs, if it's like a change in the Constitution, certainly should be taken very seriously. Uh, can you explain what your reasoning is behind the particular process that you've taken to move toward this change and why you think that this process is the correct one to take when it involves such a substantive change to the University of Kentucky? Uh, well, our, our board directed me to. <laughs> and, and I do believe that there is important to respecting um, what I would say the, the foundational representation of, of who we are going back a long time in our governing regulations. Some people, some universities, if you look carefully at those peers, have, have um, you know, bylaws or constitutions or whatever, we have governing regulations. I feel like we should work within those, to be honest with you. But we have more familiarity with those, and I think they can still be a sort of guiding star. I, I agree with that, but it seems to me that as a, a process of identifying a problem, and then working through the information relevant to that problem and then identifying certain proposals and ways we might address and resolve that problem, that the shortened timeline and the process that we're going through appears to be not very well tailored to coming up with the best possible solution for something that is so substantive and foundational to the operation of the University of Kentucky. Right. Thank you. Oh. 
I'll do to Ekman College Communication Information. Uh, thank you, President Capilouto, for coming here and once again telling us about your um, undying support of faculty governance. I came to UK in 1994 as a graduate student. Since then, I've finished a PhD here. I've been a part-time visiting adjunct faculty member. I've been a lecturer. I've been an assistant professor. And now I'm an associate professor. And in the 30 years that I've been here, I've never felt a climate like what I feel on this campus today among faculty. And I want to read from this piece of paper that someone left at my desk where it says, they attribute this to an administrator, but put quote marks around it. I assume they mean you. Quote, some faculty are disgruntled. They are overreacting. My question to you is, do you really think it's only some faculty who are disgruntled? And are we really overreacting as we face this attack that came out of an unscientific study done by a paid consultancy that you still have not answered Bob Grossman's question about? I'm not going to make judgments about a statement you found on your desk there. I will take seriously the concerns that you express. And I can imagine, given that the career you described here, that um, it is heartfelt. In listening, I still find valid reasons to continue this dialogue. It's an opportunity to improve. Herman and then Ben. Herman, are you? Yeah, can you? Excuse me, I was looking for you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Uh, okay, so a couple things. Um, you know, I, I spoke to you on Friday, and um, I was a little uh, concerned that after that uh, meeting with that set of faculty from the College of Fine Arts and Pharmacy, that you were at that point uh, just basically reading to us uh, the email that you ended up sending out a few hours later. Um, that was a listening session. It felt like you were responding back to us, but. Um, talking points that had already been um, sort of determined. Um, today, uh, I'm Herman, pleased to hear you. Herman, excuse yeah. me. Uh, yeah. You were the last group I met with on a Friday. I've been meeting all week. Took copious notes. Did I have some ideas about what we would communicate? Yes. But I promise you, I can almost tell you every word you said to me. All right? Okay. So I was listening, I promise. I, I appreciate it, and, and I, my, I was going to segue and say it feels like since then you're this uh, hearing what you're saying today that there is um, uh, some deep listening going on. Um, with regard to that, you made a comment a few moments ago about your interest in um, the more more voices, and I appreciate that. I think I think uh, some colleagues on the Senate, and I'm no longer on the Senate, but I served on the Senate for many years in a variety of capacities. Um, involving staff and faculty and, and students, first of all, has always been there for you because they do have staff senate and an SGA. But within the university senate, I agree. I think we should uh, give them more seats at the table and more voice. But with regard to faculty issues with faculty expertise, I think we need to, as you've said, still rely upon faculty for those determinations. Now, with regard to local control, one of the things that I find problematic, um, and even in, in, in a messaging and the understanding of what the University Senate does, is that the Senate is not some um, um, group that's far and away, far away from the college's faculty uh, units. It's actually connected directly to them through its committee structure, through undergraduate council, through a variety of different structures where that kind of as you say, voicing that comes from faculty that are not heard, are heard. I, I remember being on a committee where we were putting together our structure of rules, um, it was academic organization, the structure committee, and one of the things we said we would take into consideration is not is all the votes, all the votes, all the way up, on any kind of proposal coming before us. 
And those votes would be from faculty within the unit at the college level if it, if it went through any of these councils coming from them and then through the committee structure all the way through. That way, we're always listening and paying attention to those votes. And majority wasn't always what we were interested in. I was a strong advocate along with other faculty members for looking at dissents because sometimes a dissent, a dissenting voice among faculty way down at the unit level actually has a good strong point that we in the University Senate should know about and deliberate and discuss. So I've seen that process work. I never said it was perfect. It's revisable, and I think people are amenable to revising it. But I think the structure of the Senate Council, especially through its faculty governance, is the best way to hear those voices, especially coming from faculty. If you remove faculty from that um, power, that primacy, as you say, and give us only um, power um, as an advisory, as a, and I'm talking about maybe admissions, I'm talking about maybe other aspects, if you're saying you're not going to touch. But if you remove that power from us, then I think you endanger the really greatness of this university. The university works because it listens to its faculty up and down. I'm sorry, but there's a lot of administrators uh, who don't, who, who have other interests, you know, not just uh, coming from, from the president's office, but coming from the provost's office, coming from deans, that don't engage in that kind of collaborative, collective, deliberative conversation that is fact-based and reason-based. I'm not saying that you don't do all those things as well, but sometimes bottom line outweighs everything else. Sometimes uh, other interests outweigh. And when it comes to the faculty, we tend to move away from those things and make what has been really great decisions. So I, I guess I would, I would ask you, will you take all that into consideration as you consider making these revisions? Uh, and, and note, please, that you are facing a lot of opposition, not just from the disgruntled faculty member, but from a whole host of faculty members who, for the first time ever since I've been here 20 years, are seriously concerned about their empowerment within this institution. Thank you. Thank you, Herb. Ian, Loka. Hi, um, President Capilito, thank you very much for visiting with us. Um, I wanted to ask you about something specifically. I was lucky enough to attend my first Board of Trustees meeting um, uh, not too long ago and visit with a couple of the trustees that were there. And by the way, I'm a a senator in arts and sciences, and they spoke very highly of you, the two trustees that I spoke with, but also made it very clear that they defer to your leadership and your direction and trust you. Um, so I would I would like to ask you and even you know encourage you to think about the possibilities for you to speak with the trustees as our leader and and share with them not just our concerns but also perhaps a deep respect that you have for the faculty. Um, and lead within the Board of Trustees to help them understand that this is a, a very important shared governance structure. Thank you. Uh, I do believe that our faculty hold, excuse me, our trustees hold you in high esteem. Um, I can share a lot of data that compellingly show that we are advancing Kentucky but it's the stories that often move people. Um, they hear my stories because of all the work you do. And um, please know that I'll, I'll be unwavered in telling my powerful stories. President Capilouto, if I could just follow up on that with, with one thing. Um, but the point is that the trustees were clear that they defer to your leadership. So I think that that if you, if you fact, would support the Senate, that they would also support the Senate. So I think if you make clear that this is a structure that you respect, then they also would respect it too. Thank you. Know, you. I, I, and, and let me say, there's not a lack of respect here. There is clarity that is needed within, you know, realize they, they take seriously that they are the final authority on every policy at this university. 
Now it's impractical to think that we're going to take every policy to them for approval. But they also recognize that the Senate rules don't necessarily recognize that authority. And where does it stop, you know, in terms of down in the organization? I think that's the clarity they're asking for. You know, on what matters? How do we share this respectively constructed? Dan. Yeah. Well, uh, my name is Ben Braun. I'm in the math department in the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, thank you, President Capilouto, for coming and joining the Senate today. Um, so I want to make three comments um, and then make a, just ask a direct question. So the first question I have, or the first comment I have is that um, I think that there's a disconnect between the rhetoric that's being used and the actions that are being taken here, and I don't, I genuinely don't know if that is being done intentionally or if this is just something that's being perceived differently by faculty than by, uh, you know, people more on the administrative perspective. But, you know, you talk a lot about, you know, wanting partnership, wanting many voices, but then when it comes to actually making decisions about what the plan is going to be, the language shifts to talking about listening and dialogue not partnership. So like, I just want to emphasize listening and dialogue is not the same as partnership. And this comes back to Molly Blasing's comment that I think we're actually much more willing to work together than we're giving credit for. Or maybe you are giving us credit for that and it's just not what's really wanted. I can't tell because there's this big disconnect. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, and this goes back to Bob Grossman's comment early on, that a lot of this process, I feel, is very strongly based on poor reasoning from bad data. And I think that's really caused a lot of deep distrust. We, you know, at the university, the faculty and the staff and the administrators really rely on good reasoning from good data. And when the data that's being provided is, you know, acknowledged to be unscientific, acknowledged to be incomplete, and then when we're told we have to rush, 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 when <coughs> From my perspective, we have still not been given a real reason why there's a rush that this has to be done in June as opposed to waiting a few more months. You know, it does not inspire confidence or trust. Uh, so this disconnect between actions and rhetoric is really problematic for me. And the question that I have is um, kind of to, to try to bridge the gap between both of those. Are you and your team willing to tell, advise the board that it would be helpful and productive and healthy and healing for the university community to not stop the process, but slow it down, delay the deadline that, you know, has been, that you've set or the board has set, and to actually act in partnership. So that means not just listening and not just dialogue, but actually putting seats at the table for Senate council members who are our elected representatives. And I think it would be good also to include some students and some staff at those seats in this whole planning process. I mean, I do. I agree wholeheartedly. We could probably use with a little bit of restructuring of the representation on the Senate. I don't think that's a bad idea. And maybe the way we could start with that is instead of you and your team saying, we're gonna provide a plan to the board that we come up with after we listen to say, we're going to provide a plan to the board that we collaborate with everyone who is a stakeholder, with representatives that are not signing confidentiality waivers, but they're really involved in the process. Is that something you're willing to, to commit to or at least consider? Yeah, I, I, thank you for your question. And I did say in my remarks, I'll reiterate. I hope, hopefully by the end of the week, I'll put something on the table for each of the executive groups, starting with the Senate Council, on ideas I may have about this. It'll be an iterative process. It'll be on the table, I'll share it with the entire campus. And we'll see how that feedback goes. It'll be concrete are you, clear. Are, are you willing to consider advising the board to slow the process down if, as this iterative process unfolds, if people feel we need a little more time to nail down the details, uh, I'm going to the, I'm going to follow the process 
that I've outlined. If anything else causes me to think differently, I can, my mind is certainly open, but I'm following this process. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so there are two questions in the chat. One says, if we want to do this right, why can't we respectfully request more time from the board with a clear plan forward? Uh, the second question, uh, President Capilouto, you have made promises to preserve shared governance, but what would be in place structurally in terms of regulations to protect shared faculty governance if faculty would only play an advisory role over educational policy? In other words, what rules would be in place to ensure that faculty retain control over curriculum? Sure. Well, I, I think I've said that we would do that. We have to do it. I mean, keep in mind now, it's, it's out of respect for faculty. Every program goes to the board for approval. So that's going to continue to certainly be the case. The processes we use, such that when we present something to them, they have confidence in it, I think are important to preserve. Can you come to the mic? Remember to state your name and affiliation. Hi, President Capitano. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nick Anacarco. I'm with the College of Medicine. And I heard a couple things. So you said that you were willing to take in suggestions. And I did gather that there is a mission. And you said that lose forests for side of the trees. And I, I do support, too. I'm not part of the Senate, but I do support that. Uh, I feel called to fulfill the mission as has been described. That's why I kind of stay here rather than return back to New Jersey after I finish residency here to stay on as a faculty. Um, would you or be willing to pose the challenge of what is attempting to be accomplished that is perceived as the current structure is not being able to accomplish so that it might be able to reform itself in a partnership to align with common goals to accomplish whatever is trying to be accomplished <laughs> while also um, looking to avoid whatever is looking to be avoided. <laughs> Don't go back to New Jersey. <laughs> Great state. Thank you. Catherine? Oh, well, that, that, was a, that was a question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, my name is Catherine Montalbano. I'm from the School of Journalism and Media. Um, President Capilouto, I first want to thank you that I appreciate your firm stance against, uh, I appreciate your firm uh, stance against the attacks on DEI and tenure. And I just want to say that the reason I bring it up is I'm curious if you see these two other shifts with DEI and tenure intersecting with this change in faculty governance. I also want to say, I, I personally don't have an issue uh, with students or staff attending these meetings. Uh, as someone who came from a Quaker undergraduate institution where shared governance is important, it's that's valuable. But I am concerned that these three changes, again, DEI, tenure, and governance in tandem, we know that they don't operate in a vacuum, could undermine the ability of faculty to do our jobs that we are trained to do, including things like determining what courses are included in the core curriculum. So my complaint question for you is, do you see potential problems with these three shifts intersecting in a way that could impact curriculum decisions, including what courses are included in the core? So I'm going to have to leave in a little while because of recent developments. If you read the newspaper, you know what's going on. We had a bill first introduced in the Senate dealing with DEI that largely confined itself to uh, discriminatory concepts in hiring and admissions. Okay? And then there's a much more intrusive bill in the House. And I took our message in a powerful one those who believe quite differently why DEI initiatives are essential to our campus and our success. One of the things I could point to, Scott, was 
You have a performance funding model. It explicitly says underrepresented minorities. You know, that's one of the metrics you're judged on. And I can proudly say, 10 years ago, 9% of our graduates were students of color. Today it's 15% and it's a bigger number. And that takes everybody and that takes a DEI office and it takes everybody upholding those responsibilities. So last Thursday or Friday, that more intrusive bill was substituted. And on Friday, the Attorney General issued an opinion, it's not law, that also, I think, undermines the use of color in this case as uh, a factor in the way we do our business. So I cannot pretend that they're not turbulent waters. I don't think it's related to this necessarily. It's going to happen one way or the other. That's why I say time and time again, excuse me, we're not giving up our efforts on this. Okay? Still have some hope. We're still talking to people. We're still taking our case. But if anything, it emphasizes to me even more the criticality of the primacy of faculty on course content and programs and so forth. So before I leave, this is an example of how we can be better. Okay? I don't have the answers to all of these things. But in these conversations I had, and I have to say last year, I spent nearly a day at our Northern Kentucky University Medical School campus. We opened those colleges in Northern Kentucky and Western Kentucky in an effort to train physicians, recruit from those areas, those underserved areas, with the hope and expectation that they would return service in those areas. And it looks like it's working. So those students who are treating patients in those underserved areas, many of whom are uh, their patients uh, are Spanish speaking, asked to have a one-hour course um, that they recognized was not in any way going to give them proficiency. They deal with, they use interpreters and all. They thought it was a better way to connect with their patients. They also wanted to put you know, what it contained, the course, on their transcript because they want to apply for residencies in underserved areas with these kinds of populations and they wanted an advantage in the recommendation in the application. So that went through the HCCC, I believe. Is that not correct? It was approved at that level. Um, Herman described all those processes we go through. And when it started going up to the processes, there was an objection by someone who teaches a similar course, but quite different, suggestion of a three-hour course in the summer. Those are two different needs, two different expectations entirely. Lots of back and forth. That proposal ended up not advancing in any way. So that, I'm just saying, can we be better? I mean, when you go up and meet those students, and, and you meet the 45-year-old who came back to medical school because she wanted to treat people in underserved areas, she wants to take a one-hour Spanish course, 
and all these elaborate processes we have, we can do better. That's what I'm asking. Thank you all very much.